Hello again. Um, today's video is one that's been in the making for literally years. I've been after the subject of this video for almost four years. It's a very rare piece of vintage video equipment and um, I finally got my hands on one and it does work so I'm very um, happy to be able to demonstrate this device in this video and I'm um, really happy for this video to be literally the first um, recorded in-depth um, demonstrations of one of these ever. There's no information on this device anywhere on the internet or otherwise so this video is literally another one of those firsts that I always seem to uh, be so uh, lucky to do. So without further ado, let's take a look at a very cool piece of vintage electronicry. This is a Casio VF3000 portable TV and VHS VCR combination and this was made in 1988. I found this on eBay again after almost four years of searching. I've actually got a pretty funny story. Um, in 2014, I, I had started looking for these in probably 2012, 2013. And in 2014, I finally found one and, and bought it on eBay. And actually, it was mint in the box with everything. Um, I forget if it had the manual, but it was in the box. It had the machine, it had the battery, it had the AC adapter, everything um, in the box. And I remember, I, I think I paid quite a bit of money for it, 50 or $60. And the seller advertised it as perfect working, fully functional, and I got it, and it was completely not functional. The TV portion did not work at all. And the VCR portion showed signs of life, but would not even eject. Uh, a problem which I now know was due to simply bad belts, and it could have actually been fixed um, pretty easily. But, uh, alas, I sent it back. I spent too much money on it to, you know, have any bets on ever getting it working. And so I returned it, and... Um, uh, from then on, I started regretting it because I had a feeling that I possibly would never find one again. Well, fast forward to now, you know, I've for the past four or five years, I've always kept that eBay search. I get email alerts if, if one of these comes up on eBay. And this one showed up on eBay just, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And um, the seller, actually, this is where the story gets also a bit funny. Um... The seller of this unit advertised it as perfect working, but they showed no pictures of it working. So I messaged the seller and I said, hey, if it works, can you upload a photo of it working, please? And the seller responds and they say, oh, it's working in the first picture. Well, in the first picture, it's not even turned on. And I'm like, I responded and I'm like, no, it's clearly not turned on in the first picture. And they reply and they go, Oh, the, the charger is plugged in. Well, yes, the charger was plugged in in the first picture, and you can see an LED turned on on the charger. And I'm like, great, I'm not asking about the charger. I'm asking about the unit itself. If it works, can you please upload a picture of the unit working? And at this point, I would have just said, F you, good day, and, and um, gone on my merry way. But these are so rare. This is only the third or fourth one I've ever seen show up on eBay that I kept pressing and although I was a bit worried the way this seller was beating around the bush I had a feeling that maybe they were hiding something but they responded to me and they said well what what do you want to see working and I said whatever you did to determine it was working put in a tape play the tape and seller says fine so the seller sent me a picture indeed of it turned on and doing what appeared to be playing a tape I said, all right, good enough for me, and I bought it. Uh, so, yeah, I ended up buying it, and um, I am happy to say that this thing does work. Um, it does have some issues, which I'll go into in this video, but it is about 90% functional, so I'm happy. I paid a bit more for it than I'm proud to say. It actually, you know, it was a really good price, but when you add all the nuances up, it came out to quite a bit of money. I paid about... $35 for this thing, American, 
and then it was another $30 to ship it. I had it shipped straight here to my apartment. And the seller, like many eBay sellers now do unfortunately, um, shipped it through the the eBay global shipping program, which I hate because it just, it's a money gouge for buyers. And the eBay global shipping program charged me an extra $10 uh, to as, as import fees um, to ship this thing so it came out to about $75 American which is about a hundred dollars Canadian so yeah I paid a lot for this this is actually one of the most expensive things if not the most expensive thing in total that I've ever bought on eBay so thankfully it's um in really good shape um, just very light signs of use um, and it does mostly work. So this machine is a member of a class of devices that um, electronics magazines and, and such at the time thought would be the next big thing, the next big hit portable gadget. Um, portable VCRs um, and specifically portable VCRs that have a built-in television um, that you can watch the VHS tape on or even tune a TV channel and record it to VHS. Um, when you read articles at the time that this was introduced, um, they thought these were going to be the next big thing, but they ended up absolutely not being the next big thing. Um, this unit and all of these portable TV VCR combos, they were a market failure. Um, and I think that was mostly due to how expensive they were. Um, this machine had a retail price of $1,400, uh, which is an amount in today's money that I haven't looked up, so it's at the bottom of the video right now. So yeah, these these sorts of machines, and there were only a few that were ever introduced to start with, um, they just were not successful in the market, and they all disappeared by the early 90s, and they're really rare to find today. So Casio introduced the VF3000 in 1987 and as far as my research can determine they discontinued it around 1989 so only on the market for a couple of years. Mine was made in 1988 which I've determined uh, looking at part numbers inside it and this was Casio's first attempt at making a machine uh, like this at all. Casio had been making portable TVs for quite a few years, but Casio had never made a VCR. They're not a mechanical company. They don't make mechanical machines like VCRs. Um, but I do have some interesting information about the VCR portion of this thing, which I'll go over in this video. But yeah, this was Casio's first attempt at something like this. Um, obviously, it was a flop and... They're really rare to come by now, but it's a super cool device. So what you have here is a color television based on an LCD display, a color LCD display. And it's got the VHF and UHF TV tuner. And if you go around the back, it's got a full-fledged, full-size VHS VCR. So not only can you play VHS tapes, and watch them on the TV and it's got a built-in speaker as well but you can actually tune a TV channel and here's the antenna right here so you can actually tune a TV channel and record it to VHS tape the VCR is record capable not playback only so that's really really cool So I guess it's timely to go over what issues my particular machine has. Um, first of all, the TV section, like every Casio TV from this era, is suffering from bad capacitors. I've had two Casio TVs go through my hands previously, both of them made around the same time as this, both of them completely non-functional. Um, and this unit also has bad capacitors in the TV section. However, the TV section is still functional for now. When I first got it um, and tried it for the first time, the TV wasn't even watchable. You couldn't see anything. And I thought, well, um, or actually I, I was kind of surprised because you could see legible stuff on the TV in the seller's photo. Um, so I was a bit surprised, figured uh, maybe the, the shipping had jostled it and broke something, but I found that after an hour or so of just letting it sit turned on, the TV actually came back to life. 
And so I've been exercising this thing a lot and it's at a point now where when you first turn it on cold, um, the TV is just a flickery garbled mess that you can't make out anything on. But after about 45 minutes or so, um, it's actually very watchable. So, you know, letting it sit, capacitors reform, and um, it starts performing a lot better. I've been hoping that by exercising this thing constantly that maybe it would get to a point where the TV um, would work mostly fine right from a cold turn on but unfortunately I don't think it's going to reach that point. I turned it on today and it was the worst that I had seen since I first got it so yeah I would say um, you know the only way to fix this is it's going to need new capacitors in the TV section that's an endeavor that I don't think I'll ever attempt myself. It's all surface mount stuff. Um, probably a few years from now when I have some more money to blow, I will probably ship this thing to one of the few um, uh, repair people that still exist that will repair stuff like this and have them replace all the capacitors in the TV section. That will be a several hundred dollar endeavor and so obviously I won't be able to do that for another few years but it's something that I will look into someday when I do have that ability. But I can demonstrate the TV working for you in this video. What I'll have to do when we get to that point in the video is just pause it, turn this thing on, let it run for an hour or so, and then resume recording and show you the TV working. Another issue is the speaker does not work at all. Um, however, headphones work just fine. Um, my boyfriend suggested that probably the speaker itself has failed in open coil. I've been inside this thing, I tested the speaker, and indeed it, it does seem like the speaker itself has failed. So, someday, I don't know when or if I'll ever do it, I'll have to dig further into it, see if I can dig through the circuit boards enough to uh, get to the speaker and actually remove the speaker and put another one in there. And then the final problem is a minor problem with the um, VCR section. Uh, it's got a problem which I've been trying to diagnose, um, I've posted on forums, people have been trying to help me and I haven't found a 100% certain cause yet but I think it's a bad pinch roller. The pinch roller in this thing is a little on the hard side compared to um, my VHS camcorder that I compared to and what happens is um, sometimes you play a tape and the tape will build up a small amount of slack on one side of it at the pinch roller and eventually when that slack gets big enough it folds over on itself and it puts this long diagonal crease in the tape. So yeah that's an unfortunate issue with the VCR. Um, I've tried doing some stuff to uh, improve the pinch roller um, just with what I have on hand. It hasn't really helped so I think I'll have to buy some of that rubber renew stuff that people like to use. Give that a try on it and failing that um, buy a new pin roller. But yeah, that's a minor issue with the VCR but um, otherwise the VCR does work fine and I don't see any electronic issues with the VCR. Um, the VCR section seems to work just fine aside from that minor mechanical issue. So that's all the issues with this thing, otherwise it does work. Um, this is the battery right here. Let me show you this honking huge battery. There's the battery. The battery weighs a couple of pounds. It's a 12 volt NICAD battery, uh, 1800 milliamp hours. Um, Casio advertised, I believe, four hours of VCR playback on this battery. I get a little over an hour of runtime uh, VCR playback on this battery still, so that's very um, surprising. It's very impressive. 30 year old battery, and I, it still has that much charge left in it. And um, the fact that it's NICAD and not lead acid is great because it means that if I ever decide I want to you know refurbish the battery someday that should be fairly easy to open and then just replace the cells replace the individual cells or maybe even put lithium ion cells in it so that's pretty cool so I guess um, we'll begin our detailed tour of this thing so the TV screen it's a 3.3 inch color LCD display it's a standard display that Casio was using on all of their 
portable TVs at the time. It was what Casio called their HQM display, their high quality matrix display, a name which really means nothing because it's a standard uh, passive matrix color display and actually it's a really poor passive matrix color display. Very limited viewing angle, very poor contrast. Um, everything has a brown tint for some reason and um, you have to constantly fiddle with the brightness control depending on what you're looking at, what the angle is, what the lighting is, whether it's cold or if the displays had time to warm up. It's not a good display at all but it's, it's what they had at the time and it, it did the job. Um, but it's actually not a bad quality display otherwise. Color quality I find is very good. It's got nice saturated color and um, the backlight's nice and bright. It's a very bright display. Um, as, as, you know, as far as 1988 goes, it was a pretty nice display. And uh, it's got the classic Casio tuning indicator down the right side that has an electronic marker that scrolls down as it's tuning channels. It is, of course, an electronic tuner, so that's pretty nice. And these are your tuning buttons, like any Casio TV. Speaker, based on the grill, looks big and impressive, but I can tell you looking inside it, it's really nothing much. The actual driver is only like that big or so. Little red LED that comes on when the VCR is recording. And um, I love this silk screening on the plastic. It's just so 80s. You got the yellow VHF, VHS logo and the blue VF3000, really cool looking. Color liquid crystal display, auto tuning system. So that's the front. Looking at the top, you have your transport controls for the VCR. Uh, you've got a button to turn on and off the on-screen display, which is basically just a tape counter. Um, and then you've got a counter reset button. This is a switch to engage the recording. You just press that and it starts recording. Fast forward and rewind, including reverse and forward search. Stop, you got pause. You can also pause while recording, which I think is a pretty nice feature. The power switch and the eject button. And then right here is a power switch for just the TV. So kind of neat is that the VCR can be powered independent of the TV. So this is the main power switch, which turns everything on. But if you want to use the VCR, but not the TV, you just press that and the TV turns off, but the VCR um, can still do everything and um, that'll save you a bit of battery life and there's actually a couple of cool reasons that you would do this, which I'll go into later. Volume control, which of course is useless because the speaker is broken on this one, but it does work for headphones and the brightness control, which it's placed front and center because you're going to be using it constantly on that HQM display. So that's the controls on the top. And there's the left side. And here's the VCR section. It's a bog standard two head mono VCR, but it does have the HQ specification. We can eject it even when the power's turned off. Press eject. And it opens up. And there's the inside of the VCR. And a uh, very small head drum, you can see, which is kind of interesting. And actually, uh, you can read articles where, um, articles in, I think it was Popular Science, where a Casio spokesperson was talking to Popular Science. And they said the way they were able to get the VCR as small as they did for this machine was that they miniaturized the head drum. And how they were able to get around the technical limitations of a tiny head drum was where a normal VCR wraps the tape halfway around the head drum. Uh, this VCR wraps the tape three quarters of the way around the head drum to make up for the smaller head drum. So that's how they were able to get around that, which is pretty neat. And when I look at my VHS camcorder, my RCA uh, CC413 VHS camcorder from 1994, that actually has a, a full-size head drum, so, so that's that's pretty cool. The head drum in this is one that you'd normally find in a VHS-C camcorder, but they've done it for a, a full-size VHS VCR, which is pretty nice. Got a few neat things on the back, more uh, silk screening there. So, 
a really cool feature, which I actually didn't expect to find on this thing, but that's really cool, is that not only do you have an AV output, so um, you can connect this thing to an external television set or whatever, so, um, for example, you could uh, put a tape in the VCR and, and play the the VCR out to an external TV, which is pretty cool, and that's why you have the uh, independent power switch for the TV section. So that's pretty neat, but not only do you have the AV output, you have an AV input, so you can actually input something and display it on the internal TV or record it to VHS. That, I think, is a really nice feature. I wouldn't have expected that. Very cool. So we have this weird DIN jack called RF adapter. Um, my guess is, is my first thought was, well, that would be for an RF modulator, but then I thought, no, th this thing probably has the RF modulator built into it, and that's just so you can plug in a coax or the 75 ohm twin lead um, adapter or whatever to hook that up to a television set that has only an RF input, not a composite input, but I really don't know. I did not get the cable, whatever cable is meant to plug in there. Manual tracking for the VCR, there's your tracking control. And you've got a uh, tuner um, or an input select for the television so uh, you can either have the TV displaying the TV tuner or you can have the TV displaying what's ever coming in the AV input and regardless of where this switch is set when you begin playing a tape in the VCR the TV automatically switches to the VCR on the right hand side here you have a plug for an external antenna three and a half millimeter external antenna jack that's very nice and you have your headphone jack. It is mono only, so when you plug in stereo headphones, you only get sound out of the left side. And of course the battery, which you can remove like that. And uh, that is a barrel connector right there. So in addition to running it off the battery, you can run this off the external power supply, which I'll show in a moment. It is 12 volts center negative. So keep that in mind if you get one of these, a standard center positive adapter will not work and could damage the unit. It is center negative. Instructions on how to attach the battery, the battery itself of course, which we already showed. And uh, how the battery actually charges is that the battery has its own barrel jack that the power supply uh, can plug into. And uh, there you can see the battery was made in Japan. So the unit gets a bit uh, smaller when you take the battery off and it gets quite a bit lighter too. Um, advertised weight for this thing is five pounds but I don't know if that's with or without the battery. The battery itself weighs a couple of pounds which is pretty impressive. Uh, this handle can retract into the unit or you can pull it up and it locks in place. That's very nice. And uh, take a look at the bottom here. So on the bottom you have tint and color controls, standard on a Casio TV. Um, when I first got this thing and I adjusted these for the first time, they worked just fine. But now when I try to adjust them, they just spin forever without changing anything. Somehow they broke the first time I ever touched them, so that's kind of weird. So uh, luckily they're in the right place where they where they should be for for everything to look as good as possible. But yeah, they just I used them once and they were fine. I tried to use them again and they they just spin forever now. They're not connected to the potentiometers they were connected to anymore. Really weird. And info sticker on the bottom, Casio VF3000. DC 12 volts, 10.8 watts. This uses quite a bit of power. NTSC, VTR system, VHS. And there's a serial number. No way of how to decode that, but I already know when this was made anyway. Made in Japan. Very, very cool. So, 
Now for sort of the cool technical things I've learned about this just by owning one. And again, this is something that is just, this is information that just does not exist anywhere else. I'm the first person to ever discover this stuff ever about this thing. So I was talking about how it was kind of impressive that Casio, an electronic company that has really never made any mechanical devices, managed to make their own VHS VCR. Well, I have some news for you. The VCR part of this thing was not made by Casio. The VCR is nothing more than a Hitachi VHS camcorder grafted onto this thing. And I really mean grafted on. This entire machine is nothing more than a Hitachi VHS camcorder with a Casio TV stuck onto it. The entire VCR portion, the transport controls, and even the battery were all directly copied over from a Hitachi VHS camcorder. This is a standard Hitachi VHS camcorder battery. These transport controls were just, it's it, right out of the Hitachi parts bin, not even kidding. You look at a Hitachi camcorder of the same era, these, all these controls directly copied over. And of course, Hitachi made camcorders for RCA as well, right? So there are RCA camcorders that use this same battery and have these same transport controls. So yeah, this was something super interesting I found. I actually expected this. I did not expect that Casio would have um, made their own VCR. That's just not the type of company they are. They don't make stuff like that. They were making portable TVs and wristwatches and calculators and stuff like that. They wouldn't want to put a bunch of effort into making a VCR for a product which could very well have been a one-off. Um, which this pretty much ended up being a one-off. So yeah, they just got Hitachi to use one of their existing camcorders, um, stuffed said camcorder into a Casio-designed case, and then stuck a Casio TV on the front. And that's really cool, because that means that this is, you know, this isn't anything foreign. People know how to fix these VCRs. This is exactly what you'll find on a Hitachi or RCA camcorder. Um, so yeah, people know how to fix these. Um, the belts are available, the pinch roller is available. Um, it works just the same, you know, if, if a gear or something broke, um, you're not doomed forever. Just go on eBay, buy one of those camcorders, which are pretty common and, and cheap to find, and just pull the part from it and stick it in this. It is exactly the same. And I think that's really, really cool. Kind of smart of Casio to not, you know, put their eggs in trying to make their own VCR. They just don't have the engineers. They wouldn't have had the engineers to do that. So just, you know, contract Hitachi, who were known for making really good VHS VCRs, and, and just get them to stick one in it. So that's pretty cool. So yeah, standard uh, Hitachi camcorder VCR, which I think is really cool. And um, the on-screen display that you get uh, when you press the display button, all it is, it's a tape counter and a, a fuel gauge. It has an empty and full indicator. Um, that's exactly the same as what you get on uh, a Hitachi or an RCA camcorder. Same thing. The only straight Casio part on this is the actual TV portion, because Casio, that's what Casio did know how to do. So yeah, really interesting and, and quirky device, and I'm really glad that I've learned all this, um, just because it's super interesting. I'm actually a little uh, smug for myself, because before I had this thing in my hand, I posted a picture on uh, a Facebook group I'm a member of called v VTR, VCR, and Video Collectors and I posted a picture of when I won the eBay listing and, and somebody commented and said I wonder who made it um, and their guess was Panasonic and somebody replied to that comment and said that they bet it was Funai. I bet it was Hitachi and the only thing I was going on was that Hitachi was a big maker of VHS 
camcorders. Um, they made them for RCA, they made them for Sears, and um, just knowing, you know, that Hitachi was big into um, building mechanisms for other companies, they were my first guess for who might have made the VCR for this thing, because I kind of figured that Casio wouldn't have made their own VCR, and lo and behold, I turned out to be correct. Yay me. So yeah, it's kind of funny, but absolutely not surprising that the VCR portion is electronically perfect, but the TV portion is um, dying of bad capacitors because they were made by two different companies. Um, the Hitachi VHS camcorders from this era are known for being pretty reliable. It's pretty easy to get one that still works just fine. Whereas the Casio TVs from this era are known for being hard to find working ones now because they've all died of bad capacitors. So it's kind of interesting that you have a device, a two-in-one device, where one portion is electronically still perfectly healthy and the other portion is electronically beginning to uh, die. And here's the power supply which is absolutely massive and very heavy. Just look at the size of it compared to the machine itself. And uh, yeah, it's, my guess would be, although I haven't actually bothered looking it up, my guess would be this is a standard Hitachi camcorder power supply. But of course it's got Casio branding on it and a Casio model number BCK120U. AC adapter slash battery charger for use with model VF3000 and battery pack model NP-K120. And uh, that MRD788, I wonder if that could be a date code, 1988, that would make sense. So you'll see it's got two ratings on here, the adapter 12 volts at 1 amp and the charger 15 volts at 1 amp. And that's because if you look right here, it's actually got two wires coming out of it. Uh, and yeah, it's got one wire that's used for powering the unit itself and the other wire that's used for uh, charging the battery. So yeah, two different cords, exactly the same plugs on them. Each plug will fit in both devices, um, but one's meant for charging the battery and one's meant for powering the machine. Now what's kind of dumb is you'd think as huge as this power supply is, and it's, a, it's heavy too, it's a linear power supply, you'd think it would be able to do both things at once, charge the battery and power the machine. Nope, it's not capable of doing that. Um, when you charge the battery and try to power the device at the same time, it will not work. Um, if I remember right, if you're charging the battery and you go to turn the unit on, it stops charging the battery. Anyway, when you plug in the battery to charge it, you have to press this charge start button which my guess is initiates an electronic timer of some sort, probably a time-based charge, which would um, make sense for a NICAD battery. A, um, uh, well, I was going to say a 12-hour charge, but actually I've, I've charged the battery a few times, and it only takes three or four hours to charge. So it might not be timer-based, but I, I really don't know. Although it does say one amp, so... Um, it's doing, at the very least, a quite a fast charge, which is kind of impressive. But yeah, that's the uh, huge power supply. And I think that concludes the tour of this thing, so now it's time to demonstrate it. So, um, well, I, I can show you anyway, but I was just going to say, as I said before, because the TV portion is bad capacitors, before I properly demonstrate it for you, I'm going to have to turn it on, let it run for an hour or so, so um, it warms up. But uh, I'll just show you what it looks like when you turn it on cold. So we'll turn it on here. And uh, if, I, if you look at it direct on, it's got the classic Casio TV green screen of death. But when you look right here, you can see a, a bit more. So um, the brightness is way too low even with the control turned all the way up when it's cold, but once it warms up um, it improves and you can turn the brightness control down. So um, I forget what the inputs turn to. It's turned to tuner right now, so if the TV, well actually the tuner is, you can't, you probably can't distinguish the tuning indicator from all the flickery lines, but there, right there, you can see it going down, and it's going to restart, and there you can see my finger following it. So that's the tuning indicator. 
I found that when it's cold, the TV tuner will not tune into anything. However, once it warms up, it tunes just fine. I've tested it with uh, with an external with uh, my VCR, my my VCR VCR plugged into the uh, external antenna jack, and yeah, once it warms up, it works just fine. And now the uh, tuner has decided to go backwards and probably won't respond. Yeah, when it's cold, it won't respond to the buttons. So it sort of it sort of runs around like a chicken with no head until it warms up, but then it starts behaving okay. But um, I find that right from cold, the VCR part works fine, which is nice. So yeah, I will um, probably just remove the battery, plug this into the charger, and. Uh, let it warm up until the TV starts behaving correctly and um, then I'll demonstrate this to you guys. Cool! Okay, it's like four days later and I actually have some very not cool news. Uh, in the preparation for filming the rest of this video, the TV portion of this unit has totally failed. It is no longer functional. Um, basically, it was other reasons I had to leave this video for a few days. Um, when I was actually recording some stuff on this to prepare for showing in this video, um, I played it back and the recording was total garbage. It, it was just illegible. The tape, the signal hadn't made it onto the tape correctly. And it turns out that the pinch roller in this thing is in far worse shape than I thought it was. Um, it's to the point now where when you play the tape or record to the tape, it may end up working all right, or you may end up with a totally illegible recording or an illegible playback because the tape didn't get wrapped around the head correctly. Um, yeah, the pinch roller is in way worse shape than I initially thought. So I have ordered a bottle of Rubber Renew. So that's coming to me. That cost me $28, which sucks, but I consider it an investment. But yeah, when that comes, I will try it on the pinch roller in this thing, and hopefully it'll bring it back to life. Um, but that's okay. In the meantime, I can still demonstrate this thing. I just have to check and make sure that the recordings actually come out afterwards, or else I've got to retry and do it again. But yeah, the TV portion has totally failed, and basically what happened was um, I turned it on the other day with the intention of warming it up so I could finish this video. And it warmed up and it was working just fine, but I found that it didn't really look quite right. It didn't look as good as it should have for having been warmed up. So I decided to just leave it and I actually I hopped in the shower and when I got out of the shower and I came back, totally gone. Nothing left. The TV is now totally illegible. The only legible thing on it is the tuning indicator. Interestingly, the tuning indicator still shows up fine. But no input video, be it from the VCR or through the antenna input, um, it's, it's, it doesn't output anything. It's just a flickery, garbled mess of lines. However, when I hook an external display up via the composite output, this thing outputs a beautiful signal from the VCR or otherwise through the composite output. So it really is just the, uh, the, the TV portion, the actual display driver or something, has just, it, it gave up the ghost. It's too bad. It looked like it was getting better, and now and then it just did a 180, and now it doesn't work at all anymore. So unfortunately, I can't fully demonstrate the TV part to you anymore. However, when I had it warmed up and I noticed that it wasn't looking as good as it should, um, as a precaution, I did record some video of the display working just in case that happened to be its last gasp, which indeed, which indeed it ended up being. Um, so I do have a short clip here that I can show you in a moment. But first of all, what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you the just the TV tuner actually working. So if we turn it on here and turn the TV portion on, and actually, unfortunately, even though it's physically still a bit warm, it's cooled down that such that now even the tuning indicator is not uh, working correctly. And, oh, that's interesting. We have the green screen of death. Even the tuning indicator just disappeared. Oh, there it comes. So yeah, this thing is not in... Um, not in good shape anymore. Now, I don't know if the TV tuner will work correctly or not, but what I'll do is I'll grab a camcorder, 
plug the camcorder into the AV output, use the camcorder as the display, and we'll see if the TV tuner is working. Alright, and the TV tuner is working. If we look down at our external display, it's showing the menu of my VCR VCR right there. So, uh, oh, and it just went away for some reason. Uh, maybe the menu's on a, a timer. So, the, um, the TV tuner won't actually tune um, to something unless there's something to unless there's actually something displaying which is kind of odd because the VCR is outputting a blank signal but um, this thing won't tune to it there has to be something tangible being displayed for the tuner to uh, to tune to it and uh, now it's decided that uh, apparently it ain't gonna work at all let me stick a tape into the VCR the VCR VCR and maybe that'll get the tuner to work oh there we go and uh... yeah that this is a pre-recorded tape that I stupidly put in this thing to test with not knowing that it was going to chew it up and ruin it I've wanted to digitize this tape for YouTube it's a Motorola, it's not a Motorola, a Minolta um, Maxim 3XI demonstration video. It came with um, my film camera that used to be my mom's. Um, and yeah, now that has a bunch of crinkles and shit in it that was caused by this thing. So that's my bad for doing that. But as you can see, the TV tuner in this is working just fine. That video signal's coming in over the coax from the VCR on channel 3. And hey, you can, you can see it outputs a perfectly clean, crisp picture. Very healthy TV tuner in this thing. And uh, you can see right there, that's the tape counter for the VCR for this thing. So if I press the display button, see it goes away, press it again, it comes back. You can also reset it just like that, hit the reset button. And uh, when you're rewinding or fast forwarding, an indicator shows up for rewind or fast forward. And the uh, indicator also shows up while you're recording. Interestingly though, like the TV tuner itself, this indicator, um, the tape counter, will not show up unless there is a signal coming in on the TV uh, through the TV tuner so, um, or through the composite input. So if I have no inputs hooked up to this, so there's just no signal coming in anywhere, I can't see the tape counter unless the um, VCR is playing so that kind of sucks because like if I want to um, rewind or fast forward to a particular time code and I press stop so I can rewind or fast forward I can't see the time code anymore so I have to fast forward a little bit play it to see what the time code is then fast forward a little bit more and then keep doing that because the uh, the counter there only shows up when there's a signal coming in either through the TV tuner or for the composite input. I think that's kind of a, a crap idea, but uh, yeah, it's, it's too bad. So like, if I unplug the RF coming in right now, you can see the TV tuner goes away. Um, so yeah, kind of kind of dumb there, but that's how the thing was designed. And uh, yeah, if I press the buttons here. Uh, there you go, it's tuning through, press the up button to go back and you'll see the electronic tuner does a nice job of bringing it right in, perfect signal, very cool. And yeah, as you can see the TV's just toast, there's there's nothing coming in anymore, so that's too bad. So I guess um, that's really all I can demonstrate for the TV portion, but uh, I'll demonstrate the VCR portion now. Uh, I might as well turn the TV on this off. There's no point in having it on and uh, We'll stick in the only the only tape that I Dare to put in this thing until I get the pinch roller sorted out. It's my uh, my junk um, Scotch tape that already had a lot of damage to it and now this thing's caused a hundred times more damage to it, but uh so yeah, um 
for our recording test, which of course we will do with this thing, I'll be using this tape even though it's in bad shape. So um, it's going to be a pretty crappy test, but there's no way I'm going to stick in my my reference tape, my, my Polaroid Super Color, uh, for example. So we're going to be using this crap tape, but uh, VCR is turned on, and uh, we got our external display here, so put in our tape. And uh, turn it around here, and uh, uh, what I've recorded on this tape uh, through the whole length of the tape is uh, just an Emerson, Lake, and Palmer concert from uh, 1971. Uh, or 1970, actually, I think. Anyway, I recorded it from a digital source, um, so it's a nice, nice uh, example f to make a recording out of. So I'll just hit play here. But there you can see, turn my light off. It's uh, showing up just fine. That's all those funky colors are supposed to be there. And, uh, we can do a forward search here. Forward search works just fine, and you can see the tape counter works. As for this fuel gauge, this empty full fuel gauge, I find sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, I don't know why, but that's not a huge concern to me. And we can do a, there is sound. Turn the volume up on the camcorder here. So sound is working and uh, we can do a pause and there's a pause very nice clean pause and uh, unpause and let's turn the brightness down a bit for you that's a bit better uh, we'll stop and we'll do rewind and as you can see because there's no signal coming in through the AV input or the TV tuner um, I can't see the tape counter, which really stinks. Uh, oh, it stopped rewinding because it got to zero, so I gotta hit rewind again. It has an automatic stop when the counter hits zero, which I think is a pretty nice feature. Uh, it's pretty slow rewinding and fast forwarding, of course, just a camcorder mechanism. And, uh, of course, recording is SP only, and while I haven't tested it, I assume that playback is also SP only. That would make sense since, since it's a camcorder mechanism. And we'll do a fast forward here. Fast forward works just fine. Press stop. And we'll do a play. And there it's playing. And uh Yeah, working working just fine. But for now. Actually it's been working pretty good lately. I've been exercising it a ton and it doesn't seem to be chewing up the tape any more than usual, so that's good. Um it's, yeah, the VCR is behaving pretty well lately, which is great. And we will stop. Yes, yeah, it's pretty much the rundown of this thing. Um, but we're not through yet. What I will show you next is, um, as I said, I, I filmed a short video clip of the TV, the very last gasp of, of, of life that it gave. Um, so uh, I'll show a clip of that. It was playing um, pretty much a similar clip from that tape. And uh, so I'll play that for you and um, I'll give you a mixture of a direct feed from the VCR and a look at the TV so you can gauge what the quality of the VCR itself is like and also gauge what the quality of the TV itself is like. Um, so here you go. So 
yeah, as you can see, the uh, VCR works really nice, aside from, you know, because I've got a shitty tape in it that's full of crinkles and stuff. Um, the VCR really works well. It's a really nice recording it made to that tape. Um, and, uh, yeah, the out, the playback quality is great as well. Uh, a lot of wow and flutter, obviously, because of the bad pinch roller. But all in all, pretty darn good, I'd say, for, for what it is. And, uh, yeah, the display um, looked pretty nice as well as far as a Casio HQM display usually looks. It's, it's a darn shame that it died. But as you can see, aside from the really poor contrast um, and the resolution... The, uh, the color quality was really, really good. Um, and I forget if I mentioned this or not already, but um, um, where is most of Casio's early color portable TVs were known for being, for, for having super low resolution, so low that you could barely read text on them. Um, and that, I actually know that resolution of, of um, a lot of the Casio TVs um, of the time, it was 120 by 110 pixels, so very low resolution. But interestingly, the display they used in this unit um, actually had some pretty decent resolution. I only know the number of pixels, it was like 118,000 and some pixels, um, but it's somewhere in the realm of 200 and 10 by 190 pixels, so quite a bit higher resolution, and I think it would actually be good enough to read text on in a modern TV program, so pretty good. So where that clip is the only video evidence I ever have, I have of the TV ever working, uh, I think I will upload it in its entirety in a separate video. I can only give you like 30 seconds of it for YouTube copyright reasons. Um, uh, believe it or not, it almost surprises me. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer is actually copyright and can be detected by YouTube's content ID. So I can only give you 30 seconds of that. But I may upload a separate video um, just uh, of the whole 90 seconds or whatever I recorded of that uh, clip of the TV and let YouTube content ID it or whatever they want to do with it. Hopefully not block it in too many countries. Um, so you can see the whole thing if you want to. But now I think there's one more test of this thing to do, and it's what I always do with camcorders and VCRs. We are going to do a live recording test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this camcorder to the composite input of this thing, and we are going to record the video shot by this camcorder onto VHS with this unit, and then I'll play it back into the camcorder so I can transfer it to the computer. So we'll get a live look at how the uh, VHS uh, recording quality of this unit is. So let's do that. Alright, hopefully this is working, but uh, we are now currently recording on the Casio VF3000 portable VCR from 1988. I've got the camcorder here tethered to the unit via the composite input. And so we are recording to VHS right now. And uh, I'll admit, while I like the great video quality that my phone is outputting for my YouTube videos now, I do miss uh, the tangibility of, uh, of a real camcorder. I'll still film some videos on this camcorder once in a while. So yeah, we are recording blindly. I can't see what the uh, tape counter is or, or anything. I'd need to hook up another camcorder or some other display to the uh, composite input. But we do appear to be working, so I figure let's, uh, we're running off the battery, let's get up and take a walk. Oh geez. This might have been a bad day to practice walking in heels. Um, so I'm picking up the... I, I'm, I'm scared of holding this thing by the handle. I'm just scared of the plastic breaking or something. I wonder if I can get this under my... Ah, there. I'll just cradle it like that. Put it against me. <laughs> oh, and we've got... Ah, there we go. So yeah, there we go. And back in the day, back in the old days before... Um, before camcorders became a thing, um, 
how people were able to record electronic video on the go was you had an electro a portable electronic camera, just a camera, not a camcorder, and it would be wired into a portable electronic VCR or VTR. So, and the actually I think it was the VCR would normally um, the VCR would provide electric power to the camera. So you had a camera and then you had a VCR, and the camera would connect to the VCR usually via a some sort of like DIN plug or something like that. And actually a lot of modern portable VCRs, like around this thing's time, um, they had a DIN plug to accept one of those video cameras. And this thing has a DIN plug but it's not for a video camera, it's for something else. So, so yeah, back in the old days this is how people would make home movies. Um, in the old, old days you had a film camera, a motion picture camera, like a, a Super 8 camera or whatever that would take film and then you had separate camera and VCR to record with and then eventually you had fully integrated camcorders that had the camera and the recorder built in. So cool. So let's see if I can walk into the bathroom without killing myself and uh, there I am, and yes, I am wearing the same shirt that I wore um, four days ago. But uh, uh, here's the the unit, and uh, chugging along. Oh man, this is hard on the back between the the shoes and the and the uh, holding all this stuff. And I'll see if I can get down from here without killing myself. Alright, and uh, yeah, there's what it looks like, and there's the, the unit itself, so, cool, yeah, this looks really cool, and um, the VCRs of the time would be slung around, they'd have a big strap, and be slung around one's shoulder, so, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty odd and neat way of uh, of doing things, and hopefully this recording is coming out just fine. So yeah, I say let's head her back to the living room. So yeah, just kind of short and sweet, but I think that's all that. Uh, has to be done with this thing, so uh, we will uh, wrap up this video. I do that every time. Wow, that recording came out really good. I'm, I'm very impressed, and yeah, it's, it's clear that the VCR in this thing is pretty healthy. I mean, aside from the wow and flutter because of that bad pinch roller, um, the, the video and the audio quality seems really, really good. So yeah, really happy there. Um, it's kind of interesting. Something I just remembered was, um, I posted in Video Karma about this thing. Before I figured out that it was the pinch roller, I asked for opinions on Video Karma of what people might have been, what people thought might have been causing the VCR to chew up tapes. And, um, when it became clear that it was the pinch roller, um, a guy, um, a guy asked if I could provide pictures of the, uh, of the, uh, of the VCR, in, like inside the VCR, pictures of the mechanism, and I did that for him, and, um, I said, yeah, I, I think the RCA CPR 250, which is a VHS camcorder, I think that camcorder uses the same mechanism as this, and he looked at the pictures and he replied to me and he said, yep, it looks just like the RCA CPR 250. So very clearly a Hitachi camcorder mechanism. And he actually told me, he said, he, back when he worked as a repairman, he repaired dozens of bad pinch rollers in RCA CPR 250 camcorders. And he said that was in the 90s. So in the 90s, these mechanisms were having bad pinch rollers when they were less than 10 years old. So 
if the pinch rollers were going bad in them at less than 10 years old, then this thing at age 30, definitely the pinch roller's got to be toast. So yeah, I'll be, um, I'll be getting the, uh, I have the rubber renew coming in the mail and I'll be very interested to see if it, uh, improves the, uh, VCR. But yeah, other, other than that, VCR's working great, so that's, that's awesome. As for the TV portion, really, really sad that it succumbed permanently the, to bad capacitors in the middle of this video. Um, yeah, it's just, it's way too bad. It wants to work, but it's just, it's not there. And, uh, yeah, I may dig into this thing and see if I can analyze the issue and maybe fix it myself someday. I've been inside this thing. I've been inside both the TV part and the VCR part. Um, I won't be going in the VCR part again. There's no need to, but it's a little scary. Um, it's not cramped just because this thing's so big and there's not a whole lot of electronics. It's just a Casio portable TV crammed into this thing. So it's because of how big it is, everything's pretty well spread out, but there's still like four circuit boards and one one circuit board's hidden behind another and another circuit board is hidden inside of a, a metal RF shield and the, the whole of the TV circuitry has a huge RF shield that has to be unscrewed and and there's tons of wires running everywhere and it's kind of scary so I would like to dig into the TV portion um, sort of analyze what it would take to replace capacitors but I would just be scared of like accidentally ripping wires off of something and not figuring out where they go. Although the good thing is is that because the TV portion and the VCR portion are so separate from each other, by the looks of it, I could totally F up the TV part of this thing and the VCR part would keep working just fine. But yeah, someday, probably not soon, probably in the future, a future project, I'll dig into this thing see um, what the TV portion looks like. I may attempt replacing capacitors myself, like just the through-hole capacitors, or I may just wait until years down the road, send it to a professional who can do it for me for 500 bucks or whatever, and uh, just do it that way. But regardless, um, I'm really glad to finally have one of these. It took years to get one, and even though it's not fully working, I will keep this forever. This is a this is a permanent uh, member of the collection. There's no way I'm giving this up. And of course, what would this video be if we didn't look at some articles? So starting off here with Popular Science Magazine. Uh, where's the date? November 1989. Rocho. Now take your home video entertainment system entertainment center with you. A new variety of VCRs so small they fit in your hand and they include built-in TVs. Their makers chose different cassette formats but all face the same problem how to make a VCR TV combination so incredibly small. And you can read down the first column here if you want to. Uh, I think the first one they talked about was one made by Panasonic and as far as I can tell, the Panasonic unit never actually made it to the market, which is too bad because it was kind of neat looking. Like camcorders, portable VCRs have smaller head drums than home decks. Quote, the circumference of the drum used in our VHS unit is about 33% smaller than the standard one, uh, says Ted Greyer, National Service Manager at Casio. To compensate for this, you have to expose the tape to the same amount of media to get it to record and play back at the same frequency, he says. This is done by wrapping the tape further around the drum than a regular VCR. Still, that's not really the key to why this player is so tiny, Greyer says of Casio's VF3000. The reason is that the motor is tiny and has only one speed. So I find it kind of funny that um, Casio was talking about how tiny the VCR was, as if it was their own ingenuity, which it wasn't at all. They just took a Hitachi camcorder VCR. And it talks about the Sony Video Walkman, the model GV9. Good luck finding one of those. They've all died of bad capacitors. I'll let you read that. 
The new screens are not only bigger, they're better. For example, Casio's future VF4000 will have an active matrix LCD instead of the passive matrix used in the currently available $1400 VF3000. So yeah, this is very interesting. Casio actually planned a VF4000 as a successor to the VF3000, but as far as I know, the VF4000 never went to market. Um, which is sort of too bad. One with a Active Matrix LCD would have been really neat. Active Matrix systems provide a sharper picture with improved color and contrast. Now if you look at this photo right there, there's the Casio VF3000. This right here, uh, well first of all this one here that looks like a laptop, that's the one made by Panasonic which I don't believe ever went to market. And then right here, which I believe they talk about, um, the one that looks like a bigger VF3000, that one was made by Sharp, and I'm also not sure if that one ever went to market. It might have, but I'm not sure. So right here, this talking about the picture up above, Casio's VF3000, Sharp's VC-V540U, so they gave it a model designation, so it might have actually went on the market, I've yet to ever see one. And Panasonic's AV Pocket Watch prototype, which as far as I can tell, never went to market. And, uh... The fact that it was a prototype means it probably indeed never went to market. Casio's unit has a TV tuner. So based on what they're saying there, extrapolating that, these two units didn't even have television tuners. The displays were just monitors for the VCR. So Casio really was going all out with their unit. Next popular mechanics, October 1988. Video for the constantly mobile. Uh, I'll skip a lot of this. You can pause and read if you want. Talks again about Sony's unit. VHS machines are getting smaller as well. Casio's VF3000 TV VCR measures 8 inches by 6 inches by 3 inches and weighs about 5 pounds, twice that of the Sony Video Walkman. The screen is slightly larger at 3.3 inches. List price is $1300. Identical to that of Sony. How small a VHS TV VCR can be made is restricted by the size of the VHS cassette, of course. However, many manufacturers may follow Casio's lead in downsized TV slash VCRs. Casio uses smaller video heads than those normally used, but wraps the videotape three quarters of the way around the head rather than the customary halfway around. By doing so, the same amount of videotape comes into contact with the video head as in larger VHS machines, which... They're saying this like it's something special. It wasn't. VHSC VCRs and camcorders were doing this years beforehand. So yeah, it's 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 a really cool device, and I I'm very happy that I get to provide the very first in-depth demonstration of one of these ever, pretty much. And um, yeah, really really great. Um, I mentioned early in this video how this was sort of a one-off from Casio, um, you, but that's that was actually sort of a white lie. Casio actually did make a successor to this unit. I talked about how Casio themselves had talked about the VF4000 and how it would have an active matrix display, but the VF4000 was never released. Well, I do know that Casio did make and sell a successor to this. It was called the VF7000, and I've only ever seen one. One showed up on eBay many years ago. I've never seen one since. I think I may never see one again. Who knows? There's not even a picture or a mention of the VF7000. You Google whatever you want, you'll find nothing about the VF7000. But I found one once on eBay many years ago. It looks similar to this. The design was slightly updated. The multicolored print screening was gone and it was a bit more rounded. It basically looked like a Casio TV from the early to mid 90s. This looks like a Casio TV from the mid to late 80s. The VF7000, to my recollection, um, years old memory, it looked pretty similar to how this thing would have evolved to the early to mid 90s, just like a Cas the Casio TVs evolved in that era. Um, but it mostly looked just the same. I hope someday 
that I see another one at the very least so I can grab the picture, save the picture and, and know what they look like and maybe even buy it, who knows. So yeah, this wasn't a total one-off. Casio tried again with the VF7000 but obviously it was another flop and apparently it's way more rare than the VF3000 is. Something else interesting is that I have learned that Casio sold a modernized version of this in Japan, only in Japan, around the turn of the century. It was called the VF5, and it sold really well, and it looks really cool. Um, if you go on the Japanese Yahoo auction site, um, there's tons of them for sale there. Um, nothing comes up on the Japanese eBay, but there's ton on, tons on the Japanese Yahoo auction. And yeah, they look, the VF5 looks really cool. Um, it appears to, I guess it's about the same size as this because it's still a full size VHS camcorder. Uh, it does say Active Matrix. And uh, yeah, it's just a, a modernized version of this. Um, made around the turn of the century, if I had to guess. And it's too bad because when I Google the VF5, I come across one English language article that suggests that Casio planned on selling it in the North American market, but they only ever sold it in the Japanese market, which is too bad. With that said, they use NTSC in Japan. So if I were to have one of those shipped here from Japan, I'd be able to use it. I could play VHS tapes in it, as far as I know. The TV tuner may not work because Japan might have a different channel system, I don't know. But the actual RF system, the actual color system, is the same as North American NTSC as far as I know. So who knows, maybe someday I'll see if I, if I can contact someone in Japan, get them to, to buy a VF5 and ship it to me. That would be really, really cool. I'd have possibly the only VF5 in North America. That would be pretty awesome. But for now, enough reminiscing. Um, that's all there is to show of the Casio VF3000. A cool, rare piece of, of vintage electronicry. Um, sort of an experiment by Casio. that It didn't end up being successful in the market, but it sure makes for a super cool device. Two in one. And uh, as I uh, remember now, I'll, I'll throw up a picture, someone else's picture of the box for one, Casio wrote, TV and video together at last. Uh, a love story of the ages, I guess. But yeah, what a cool device. And you know, they thought, they thought that these would be the next big thing and they just weren't. So uh, it's sort of a rarity and I'm really glad to own one, even if it's not 100% uh, working. But I'm really glad that I get to show you guys this thing today, and uh, I really hope you've enjoyed it. Um, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you later.